inevitably. There are so many lies that are circulated about what is going on in my country that people are often apt to think that England is united behind Mr. Churchill and that the English people know why they are fighting. Well, that is completely false. We used to live under a system of free speech and of free opinion, which, in principle, was quite all right. But for a long time now, and especially since the beginning of these hostilities, our British constitution has been completely travestied. Instead of a system of free speech and of free opinion, the English people live today under the worst possible form of dictatorship, not the dictatorship of a patriot who desires to save his country, but the dictatorship of an oligarchy whose interests, for the most part, run completely contrary to the interests of the British people. To explain this, we've got to go back one second to the time when the British Empire was built up. This empire was built up by our great adventurers, such as Drake, such as Clive, such as Captain Cook. People who, in a certain sense, might be compared to the Norwegian Vikings. But these people, in the course of their conquest, may have committed acts of piracy and of banditism does not take away from the fact that they were animated with a great ideal for their country and the desire to bring that country wealth and prosperity. Unfortunately for us, from the time of Queen Victoria and from the time of the Jude Israeli, these conquests, which had been obtained by English genius and by the sacrifice of the best English blood, became the property of this tiny clique of people who actually control England today. These Jewish merchants, the Aryan merchants, and the aristocrats who have prostituted themselves to international finance have exploited in the sole interest of their clique conquests and the riches that were conquered by real English. One day, a day of reckoning is going to come when these two men, Roosevelt and Churchill, their friends and the plutocrats, Jewish and Aryan, will find themselves face to face with European civilization that they are at present doing their best to stab in the back while that civilization is fighting against the horde from the east. Not only will they come face to face with that Europe, with that civilization, but also they will have to explain themselves to their own fellow countrymen, to us Englishmen, whom they have so shamefully betrayed, to the widows, to the orphans, to the crippled sailors and to the crippled soldiers of what was once the great British Empire. They will have to explain why, when we had everything, when no one menaced us, they plunged us and civilization with us into this hell. I didn't take the road to Berlin because I disagreed with Winston Churchill over the beverage plan, which incidentally has died, or as to how the British post office was to be run, but because I have the desire to walk along my English Piccadilly, a hundred yards from which I was born, and to say what I like when I feel like saying it. What I have done, I shall never regret, because as each day passes by, it becomes more and more obvious that the present war has very little to do with flags, with passports, or with anything that previously constituted a nationality. We are face to face with a war of conception, whether we like it or not, something that can only be compared to the wars of religion of some 300 years ago. 
There are 70 odd nations in the world, but there are only three choices open to us. That of communism, of Judeo-Mongol destruction of this civilization of ours. That of a reaction, of a plutocracy, which hopes to keep in its twisted and blood-stained hands the privileges, wealth, it has acquired and stolen from the working classes. Or else, the road many of us have chosen, that of a real revolution. A revolution which is nationalist and socialist. We shall probably have a very hard fight. Never mind. For my part, I refuse to believe that our civilization, which has taken 2,000 years to build up, can perish in front of the conceptions of the Talmud and the wild barbary of the steppes. And any student of history can see that never has a reaction, an attempt to return to the past, triumph over a revolution which was young and active. But as an observer, I am assured, and I'm sure, the sun will rise tomorrow, but a victory of the liberators of Europe, whether they come from the east or whether they come from the west, is a Jewish victory. And that victory is the end of our civilization, the end of Christianity, the end of 2,000 years' aspiration towards something better. And all that will be wiped out and washed out. And it will disappear as Babylon disappeared, as Athens disappeared, and as Rome disappeared. And we shall be plunged in a dark, barbarous era because we will not have shown ourselves capable of defending that civilization, because we will not have been able to add our little link to the long chain of progress that our ancestors have handed on to us. And it's no good remaining in one house the smug comfort of bourgeois principles when the very foundations of civilization are rocking under it. It's just as useless to try and read the future in the bottom of coffee cups or by night in sitting up late and trying to study the stars to find out who'll win the war. It's also quite silly to think that somehow or other everything will work out all right. Because if one takes the trouble to study history, after the passage of the barbarians, whole civilizations, their languages, and their people have completely disappeared from the face of the globe, like a sandcastle being flattened out by the waves of the sea and the seashore. But Mr. Roosevelt is building a lot of aeroplanes. Can't stop him doing it. But the English are preparing to invade Europe. We can't stop them trying. The Russians cross the Polish border. It's very regrettable that it doesn't change anything. It doesn't stop, as I've said, and many with me, for over 10 years. Mr. Roosevelt and his Jews are the festering sore of humanity. But the plutocrats of London wanted this war, and now they've got it. And that the communists are the greatest danger civilization has ever been faced with days of the destruction of Rome. If, ladies and gentlemen, we have not the courage, all of us to get up and to fight for civilization, or at least to help civilization, as much as we each individually can, not only will our civilization disappear, not only will we all be dead, we ourselves, our politicians, our terrorists, our bankers, our bourgeois, our intelligentsia, who only leave to history vague memories of decadent and purblind imbeciles quarreling amongst themselves unintelligible quarrels and stupidities, face to face with the horn out of the eastern steppes, face to face with the wild imperialism of Judah. We shall leave the history, the record, so pusillanimous, so vague, and so incomprehensible. The barbarians that would have mastered, holding history, the 
nay, a thousand times greater, a thousand times more prestigious than ours. Well, Mr. Emery, that's very interesting and very nice, but you are in Germany when your country is at war with Germany and most of the countries of Europe. Then aren't you a traitor? Well, my good friend, only history would be able to judge whether I am a traitor or not. <laughs> 